Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to the Microsoft Surface Pro 9. Today, I'm going to be testing the heck out of this machine. We want to see what its capabilities are in terms of doing music production, of doing audio, MIDI, virtual instruments and plugins. Is it a decent platform for running a little studio on? That's a question that I've been asking ever since the Surface Pro 3. I've been doing this for years for years and I continue to do it even though my interest perhaps have expanded into into a more of a hardware situation I'm still fascinated and inspired by this little machine what attracted me to it in the first place was the idea that it's a, a simple light portable touchscreen enabled creative little space that runs and absolutely most importantly it runs regular Windows and runs regular desktop software. It's not like an iPad where I'm trying to work out apps and other bits and pieces and there's only a certain range of things that will work. This will run with everything, with all the peripherals. You can plug everything into it. You can run all the plugins you already own. You can run the software that you're used to because it's regular Windows. So it's a combination of this this hybrid form factor, the touchability, the pen, its ability to run and integrate with everything that for me makes it just a fantastic little, little music making machine. However, it's not always as simple as that. As if you've been watching my channel, you'll know if you've been following the Surface and other laptops like it, you'll know that there are some hoops perhaps we have to jump through to get it to work. Why is that? Well, I'm going to show you all of that. I'm going to demonstrate what it does out of the box. I'm going to show you how it performs with virtual instruments and audio recording and music making. And then I'm going to show you how to improve upon those basic requirements. Because what we're looking for, ultimately, as musicians, as someone with a machine that we want to record, and produce music on. We need stability. We need consistent power, stability, and glitch-free, low-latency audio. Those are the key requirements. Without those, you just can't you just can't do it. It's pointless. It becomes pointless. And this, I should stress, has nothing to do with the power of your CPU. People are always saying to me, oh, yeah, you just need a more powerful CPU. No, that's not the case. It's not the CPU that's the key in all of this. It's an aspect, absolutely. But the key is whether the system as a whole is able to translate audio data over its own buses and out to our ears without choking, falling over, or having a fit. That's the key. And most computers can do it, but not always immediately, and they might need some help. So I'm here to help with that. Now this is probably gonna be quite a long video. I'm gonna get deeply into these sorts of things and all of the, all of the potential problems uh, I will tackle along the way. We'll talk about all the different ways you can do things, what you can plug in, how that's going to work, how best to get the performance out, and whether at the end of the day, it's a worthwhile platform for running on. Now I should absolutely stress that it has always been with every generation, with, with every version, regardless of the roadblocks and Microsoft seem to be determined to throw in our way, we have found a way around it to turn this wonderful little machine into a decent studio. Every time it's worked. So this time I don't anticipate there to be any real challenges except for the usual ones. <laughs> the usual ones being that a laptop of this nature, and it's not just Surface, it's for all laptops that have these sorts of processors inside. The idea, the concept and design behind it is to run as long as possible on battery, to provide occasional bursts of energy when you need it, when you're working in Photoshop and you just need to render something or you need a process to work, it will speed up and turbo boost, it will grab and let you do all of that and then it will come back to its resting state, which is as low as machinely possible that it can run. Because it wants, it wants battery. Now we're not interested in that particularly because what we need is a processor that runs all the time. And the difficulty we have with these sorts of machines is that the machine doesn't want to do that. It wants to keep shutting it down. And that can be a problem. Consider, I mean, I'm going to demonstrate this in a little bit, but just to throw this idea out here, you've got a project, you're working on your project, you've got a whole bunch of uh, virtual instruments, you've got guitar, drums all going, plugins running, and it's all running along at a certain level of CPU. That's fine, that's great, that's what we want. 
Now the problem is, is that when this hits a particular temperature, the system's going to go, oh no, this is no good, I'm going to have to cool down. And so it pulls the CPU power level down, and suddenly your project is going to crackle, and then fizz, and then crash and fall over. That's no good. So we need to find the balance at which we can have full on CPU power while maintaining the right temperature profile so that it doesn't clock down and destroy your project. That's the aim of today's experiment. Now I've been testing this, so I've had it for about six months, and I have to say, out of the box, it's done really, really well, very encouragingly well, which I'll show you in a moment. However, I haven't done any tweaking to it. I've just let it run as it is. And so I don't yet know what the result of this video will be. I don't actually know whether we're going to get to a happy place. I mean, I think there's already a semi-happy place, just as it is. But to get it over that hurdle, to be able to become something a little bit more serious, that is still in question at the moment. So that's quite exciting. I'm looking forward to doing all of that. So let's stop with the storytelling and let's get on with actually talking about the product how well that works. Let's see how that goes. So here it is, a Surface Pro 9 in its physicality. It is very much following the same style as all the previous versions with the kickstand. Kickstand at the back and detachable keyboard as such. Now this follows on from the Surface Pro 8. The 8 changed the game somewhat in changing the format while you know, maintaining the same idea. It changed the style of bezel around the outside. It increased the screen size, giving you much uh, smaller, narrower bezels at the side. And also changed the keyboard to accommodate this charging space for the now rechargeable pen. It's flat, weird pen, <laughs> but it works absolutely in the same way. In fact, this is the pen from the Surface Pro 8. So I thought, I'm just not gonna buy another one. I've had enough buying a pen every time. And it sits in there, it recharges, which means you're never going to run out of battery, and it folds up. It's good. It, it works as a system, and I'm completely happy with that. Now, the buttons have changed. They have moved. With the Surface Pro 8, I don't know if you remember, the, uh, the buttons were at the side here. So you had your power button and your volume buttons at the side, and you had your USB ports at this side. The problem with that was, whenever you plug something into the side, you would also push on the other side in order to steady it as you push something in, and you would turn the computer off. Genius bit of design. <laughs> that would happen to me all the time. It's not something that you get over. You just forget, and you do it, and you turn the blooming thing off. And if you're in the middle of a project, and you're trying to plug in a thumb drive to move some files across, it's extremely frustrating. Thankfully, with the Surface Pro 9, they have repositioned them back at the top, which is where they've always supposed to have been. Bag at the top, power, volume at the top. And you've now moved your USB ports over to this side. So you've got two here, USB-C, which is very, very good to see, but no legacy port whatsoever. You've just got two USB-C ports. The other thing is that there's no headphone socket. This is the first time they've dropped that. They've, you've had a headphone socket all the way through, and that's been been great. You know, that's one of the reasons we like we like PCs as opposed to iPads because it's there, you know, it's Apple that tends to make all these things disappear. But heck, they've taken it away so we can no longer plug in our earbuds or plug in our headphones or plug in an output to our speakers or to the rest of our studio and joyfully use that. That's a real pain. Oh my goodness. What do we do about that? Well, luckily... There's a little twangy thing. This thing, yes, yes, adapters, oh yeah, yeah. Do they cost an arm and leg? Yeah, of course they do. So this it will turn one of the USB-C ports into a headphone output or a line output that we can use within our studio situation, which is very, very useful. But it takes up a port. So it, it's a major disadvantage. Removing that port is, is a shame. It really is. It disadvantages us from the other things we want to run and means you've got to run more peripherals or a hub or other bits and pieces. It just makes it slightly more inconvenient. The other change is that the power socket for the same sort of power connector is now halfway up here. It's there, which is just plain weird. 
<laughs> used to always be down here, you know, nicely tidily out of the way. Now you've got this thing sticking out the side, which is just odd. So they made some odd decisions. They made some good decisions in moving this back around here. We've got two USB-C ports. We've got no longer got the problem of turning the thing off all the time, but we've lost the headphone socket. And so it's, you know, there are pros and cons to this new form factor. We also, of course, have Windows 11, which is fine. I, I've kind of lost my enthusiasm for really getting to grips with operating systems and really drilling down into what they're all about. You know, if it works, then that's fine. I mean, with Windows 10, I think Microsoft really brought everything back together and it seems to be back to the sort of the Windows 7 kind of realm of things just being calm and working. And that was great. And Microsoft says, yeah, that's the last OS we're ever going to do. Awesome, I thought. Windows 10, yeah, that's good. Windows 11 comes along. Well, fancy that, because there's a whole bunch of designers at Microsoft sitting around twiddling their thumbs going, well, what do we do then? I know. Let's put some bells and whistles in, because everybody loves the bells and whistles. And so, and so we have Windows 11 with some bells and whistles. However, my experience of it so far on both my, my main desktop machine and on this has been that oh, it's all right. <laughs> It's really all right. I'm not going to fuss about it anymore. It just seems to do the job okay. I'm just going to get on with making the music. So which Surface Pro 9 is under test? Well, it's the i5 16 gigabyte. That's the one that I've gone for. It's generally speaking the one I go for. I try to go for something in the middle. The reason being that I don't want the entry level one. No, who wants the entry level one? Um, but I also don't want the massively powered one. And the reason for that is because the i7 tend to run hot you know tend to it's not a given but for the extra power that it potentially gives you it's more likely to clock down quicker and to hit its thermal boundaries faster than an i5 an i5 just sits around it's cooling is better it doesn't tend to clock down quite so easily and it just gives you a good solid response the i7 personally for me just seems to be flying too high too close to the sun it's going to end up getting burnt so that's why i i go for the i5 it's a solid choice i think this little app here at the side that you're bound to ask about is called the sidebar monitor and it very simply gives you a readout of the clock, the load and the temperatures and also gives you a little graph which we'll be using in our testing later on. So I think that's everything. Let's get on with testing some music software. Right, our first issue is that we don't have a headphone port. So all we've got is the speakers until I plug this little fella in. So let's just do a couple of things on speakers first and then I'll plug this in in order for us to be able to hear the sound a little bit better so I can record it properly over there as we're playing back. So there I will be testing all sorts of uh, different bits of software and software synthesizers just to give you a range of idea of as what's going on. So let's kick off with something piano-y because I think that's always a good, good place to start. So this is the Stage 73 from Arturia, it's an electric piano. How do I play it? How do I play it? What, what, what do I have to do to play it? Well, we're going to need to install a MIDI keyboard of some kind, I suppose. I mean, I can play it on screen. Oh, <laughs> but, but you know. What we want is a MIDI keyboard. So I've got one here. It's a launch key, key from Novation. It's nothing particularly awesome about it. But of course, the first problem you're going to run into is that you've only got a regular USB end on your USB cable from this device. So how do I plug it into USB-C? Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it. One way is to use a little weenie adapter like that. Stick it on the end and it gives you a USB-C and I can plug that in the side. What I will do instead i'm going to use a hub like this it's just a hub got it from amazon whatever you know it's a u it's got what I'm dangling it about it's got a usb c on this end and it's got regular usb ports there and that's just going to allow me to plug in different things before i run out of ports so already we're having to dangle a great big you know peripheral off the side of the thing but hey we've got to do what we've got to do so i'm gonna plug that in there in there take my midi keyboard plug that into there it now lights up La -da. and 
we can get on with playing this. So we just have to make sure that's turned on. There we go. I mean, one of the first tests I always do on a machine like this is just see how well it sustains notes when playing. So what we're looking for, we're looking for glitches in the playback, glitches in the sound as we're playing something. Because what the computer is having to do is generate sound in real time and get that to the outputs. That's not an easy task. So I get a sustain pedal, put a load of sustain on. and see if there's any kind of glitching, which there isn't. Let's try another one. Now, at this point, I feel <laughs> it's come up incredibly small. I mean, one of the challenges of the surface, actually, is because it's got a very high density screen, you, the sizes of things are sh always shifting depending on what piece of software you're running. So most things these days have the ability to resize, which is great. But with things like the Arturia ones, it gets, all gets a little bit small in there until you blow it up. But then it gets, if you load it up as a plug-in in another piece of software, it'll be huge and you've got to reduce it down again. So for this one, I'm going to plug in this thing here. So this has to go into my other port. And then I can use a cable to plug it into my system so that we can hear it properly. At least I hope so. <laughs> I don't know that I've actually done this. So let's see if we've now got an option. For headphones. Yes, we do. Okay, headphones only only generates itself once you've plugged that little thing in. Otherwise, you don't get the option. Okay, it's now coming out of my system over there. So I'll be able to record the output of what we do. Perfect. It seems completely fine. And let me tell you that the, the feel, the, uh, the latency is good. Now, what's latency? Okay. Well, latency is the, the difference in time between triggering an event and actually hearing that event happen. So in very real terms, hitting a key and hearing the sound. When people talk about latency in computer audio, that's what they're talking about. That delay. Because ultimately you're pressing something, that, you know, a signal's going into the computer, it goes, oh, hey, play a note. And the computer goes, oh, right, okay. It goes over to the software, we need to play this note. And it goes, right, which note is it, this note? Right, great, let's generate it, generate it, generate it. Now we're going to have to buffer it, got that together, good, good, now send it out to the output. There it goes. So all that process has to go on and there's, there's a finite amount of time that that takes. And there's a more time required to make it do it well. So anyway, anything can throw something out immediately, but if you actually want it coherent and not full of holes, then it needs to be buffered. So a buffer is like a bucket. It puts all the information in there and lets it sort itself properly so that it streams nicely. That's the idea. However, if you have an enormous bucket, it takes a long time for all that stuff to come out. So it needs to be a small bucket, a small buffer size. But still large enough for the processor to run it successfully. So we have this kind of this tension, this dynamic between the speed we want the system to work and the the clarity and perfection of that. You know, the smaller we make that buffer, the harder the processor has to work to make that happen and the closer it gets to breaking up and not managing it. So we have to find a balance between that buffer size and the processor. So that's part of our task here. Now, Microsoft have been working on their Wasapi drivers for a long, long time, and they've always been just shy of being good. They're always just not quite working, not quite good enough. They've always 
tends to end up being more like 15 to 20 milliseconds of latency, which is just kind of outside of what feels nice. You want something to feel playable, to feel like you're actually part of that instrument. And if the delay is too big, it won't feel that. Now, delay is real in real life. If you're playing a grand piano, then you're actually a long way from the thing that's generating the sound. It's all the way over there. It's a couple of meters away. And that's going to generate, you know, six, seven milliseconds of latency, purely by the speed of sound traveling in air. So when we're talking about latency, we have to have a bit of a grip on what we're actually talking about and not get tied up in the numbers. But generally speaking, in my experience, anything under 10 milliseconds is all right. And that seems to be about what we're getting. It feels completely playable and that's that's good. That's really good. That's not often something that I can say about Wasapi drivers. They always seem to be just that little bit laggy. I mean, it's not, it's not fantastic and it will get better later when I show you about installing audio interfaces, but at a push, it's all right. I'm gonna try some drums, which tends to give a, a, a better indication of whether something is feeling playable or not. So this is Contact from Native Instruments. This is a, a sample-based piece of software, so it's using samples that are running off the, off the solid-state disk, rather than a virtual instrument which is generating the sound down to the CPU, if that makes sense. It's a sample-based rather than CPU-based. Okay. It is playable. It, I'm feeling it drag just that tiny bit, but it is playable. So what I can say, first of all, for the Surface Pro 9 is that uh, the onboard sound using Wasapi drivers is usable, absolutely usable. I've got no crackle, no problem. Um, my meter up here is not, it, it doesn't care. It's just wandering around at about 1.2 gigahertz. It doesn't mind. So playing any kind of uh, instrument, any kind of synthesizer, uh, just as a single instrument, it's having a lovely time. It's great, we're having fun, we're making music, we're having a nice time, and that's exactly what the Surface Pro 9 is all about. That's why it's so good. The interaction, the ability to use touch, I'm not having to drop to the trackpad, not having to find a mouse. Obviously everyone goes, yeah, but iPad, iPad, yeah, but I'm running desktop synthesizers. I'm running desktop software. I'm attaching MIDI interfaces, audio interfaces, and other peripherals easily and sensibly. <laughs> And that, for me, puts their heads and shoulders above any other kind of touchable tablet style device. Right, what's next? Next is ASIO for All. ASIO for All is our old friend, which is a fantastic piece of fudging software, which has enabled us for years on Windows to use the onboard sound within a system at a much better level of performance and within bits of software that don't normally support Wasopi drivers. I mean, everything supports Wasopi now, right? No, no, it doesn't. The key one being Ableton Live. I mean, people like using Ableton Live, massive user base out there. It still does not use anything other than MME drivers in Windows, unless it's ASIO. So let me show you that. So under its audio engine within Ableton Live, you just get MME DirectX, which is the old school, the old school Windows drivers. And it gives me an opportunity to demonstrate to you exactly how terrible that is. <laughs> so this is what we used to be having to deal with all the time with everything before Wasapi came along and before Microsoft had a good decade to massage Wasapi drivers down to something approaching 10 milliseconds. So anyway, so I've set up the audio engine as the, the regular Windows drivers of, of old. 
if I bring in a uh, synthesizer, like a nice mini Moog style thing. There we go. Can you can you hear that? I'm banging the keyboard particularly loud to try to let you hear the difference between hitting that and hearing the sound. There's a noticeable delay. Which makes it weird to play, uncomfortable to play. But that's what we were always dealing with before things like ASIO for All came along or using proper audio interfaces, which we'll come to shortly. So what can we do in Ableton Live? Well, we can run this piece of software called ASIO for All. Now, ASIO for All has been you know, recently kind of improved and sorted out, which is great, but they've kind of stuck it onto this website, which is full of adverts and terrible things, trying to get you to download terrible things, which is a, just an absolute pain. But if you go to ASIO for All, so ASIO, A-S-I-O, the number four, all a l l dot org you will find your way through just ignore the adverts keep going it's not this one oh my goodness even even you know, the guy even apologizes for the last website which was worse than this but hey i mean you know it's a wonderful piece of software he should absolutely get advertising revenue for that but you keep on going down you'll finally find finally version 2.15 tap on that ignore that advert Ah, there's things going on, and you'll find it here. There we go. And there it is, final version, blah, 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 download. Go to the downloads, and you'll find the version in the language that you want. Download that, install it, and then I'll show you what happens. So in Ableton Live, we'll go back to our audio preferences, and under here, we'll select ASIO, and then from the devices, ASIO for all. Uh, it kind of brings up the input output config and that now hopefully should give us better performance within Ableton Live, which it does, but we're back to speakers again. So, okay, so for the configuration in here, you go to hardware setup and it brings up this, um, it's kind of a, I mean, it's a very, it's a very useful control panel for ASIO for all, but it's not the friendliest thing in the world. So it's got here, it's, it's now selected this as the as the device list, because what ASIO for all does is it finds all the audio systems within your, your system and lets you choose them. You can even put different ones together. So it does have the ability to let you run a couple of different audio interfaces together at the same time. Although it's, it's still a bit of a fudge. And ultimately this is still a bit of a fudge but it's very, very useful. So can we get to, yes, here we go. So down here, this, this entry down the bottom here is for the Surface USB-C audio adapter. So I need to select that one as the audio engine, not the speakers, which is what it was otherwise connected to. I'm just gonna leave everything else as is for the moment. And now it's coming out over there. So that is now working phenomenally better. Brilliant. So that works great. So I've now got Ableton Live. I could run a project in Ableton Live and it will come out of the headphone output and it will work and you can run it and you don't need to have anything else. You don't need anything clever attached to do that. You don't need an audio interface necessarily. Come to that, don't need a MIDI keyboard even. You can do everything on the screen. So if you were sitting on a bus or something like that, you could do that. So let's open just a demo just to show you um, Ableton Live playing back in its regular form, doing a project on the Surface Pro 9 with no tweaking, no special equipment other than a Surface um, adapter for USB-C to give me audio and it should just work. It's just 
Now that's interesting. Do you hear that? That, that is the glitch. That is the glitch, which is not not a very happy sound, is it? So what I notice over here is that uh, the processor suddenly had a whole lot more to do as it hit the bigger part of the project. It was going, oh my goodness, I need to go and do this. And so it leapt up in speed to try to cope with that. Wasn't able to do it entirely fast enough and so glitched. That's the sort of thing that we're trying to look at today. So playing individual instruments, as I've shown you, doesn't seem to be any problem at all for this. Untweaked, ready to go, out of the box. Playing a larger project might be a bit more of a struggle. But of course, all of this is a how long is a piece of string type of question, because it depends how many plugins, how many instruments, you know, what is it that you're running? Because you obviously you can't run a project that's bigger than what your computer can handle. What sort of size project is that? Those are the questions. So I think what we should do now is plug in a, a proper audio interface to make sure that the audio engine is behaving as well as it can possibly be. Because ultimately you are going to need an audio interface. Because if you want to get sound in and you want to get decent sound out and you want a decent level of performance, then getting an audio interface is going to be very important. It's the one thing that really transforms this into a proper music making studio. Now, what does an audio interface look like? Well, I'm gonna probably use mostly this one, the Arturia Mini Fuse 2. Uh, simple, good, you can plug proper microphones in the front. You can plug a guitar in, you've got knob control over levels, you've got proper headphone outputs, you've got proper outputs on the back. You've also got a MIDI interface for plugging in synths and keyboards and stuff. So that's a superb box for this sort of thing. But there are all sorts. For instance, look at this little fella. Look at that. This is a little one from Zoom called the AMS-22. Same deal. I mean, it will just hang off a cable on the side and it gives you proper line level outputs. It gives you gain controls. It gives you a microphone or guitar input, headphone socket. Brilliant. Brilliant little thing. Or you could go for something a little bit more mighty like this. This is the SSL-12 from Solid State Logic. And it's awesome. You've got like a row of four mics at the back, guitars, outputs. You've also got uh, a digital inputs. You could add another eight inputs. So you can record a whole band into your surface with awesome levels of control and characterful preamps and all sorts of bits. So you can go as far as you like. Absolutely. Or as simple as you like. I'll go for something in the middle, which is the, uh, the Arturia thing here. Now, this is a USB-C device, so it can run on a USB-C cable. So I can take out the onboard sound one and now plug this in with a, with a regular cable. So let's try... I mean, as I said, I haven't done this testing yet. So this, I'm discovering this as we go. So let's turn live back on and see if it will run that project now using the, the better driver architecture and hardware and interface that is the Minifuse 2. Now, the thing is, because this system is not tweaked yet, we're probably going to experience exactly the same thing. <laughs> but we shall see. Is it going to be better behaved? All right, let's check that we've got the audio engine sorted out. So on ASIO, we're going to go to the mini fuse. Uh, that's already halved the latency, which is just exactly what we're after. Let's see whether it's going to, uh, to do the job. There you go. See, that was fun. So installing a proper audio interface that has proper drivers designed to do all of this rather than a fudge with ASIO for all or using Windows with soppy drivers, which are honestly designed for movie playback and games and things like that. Using something for properly designed for the job gives us a much better playback. Now the CPU speed here, we're still lumping about the place, we're still going whoo, up high and back down low again, and that could have caused us some glitching, but it didn't. We got good smooth playback. Now that's just a really great example of why a proper audio interface is 
what you need. You need to be, you need to have one. You need to be have one. There's no question of it. It's going to improve your music making experience on the entire platform. Now, the other thing you're going to get, of course, is better response to software synthesizers and and that sort of thing through this audio interface. So if we just go back to our piano for a moment. That response is as real time as it gets really it feels it feels great there's not even a shade of lag because like using those happy drivers there was just this, this little bit of drag going on with this nothing at all perfect absolutely brilliant and the fact that it's running completely glitch free without me having to tweak anything is is awesome brilliant so far so good right two test the limits of the system to see what needs to be done to see what tweaks need to be applied we need to we need to cane the cpu within an inch of its life so to do that we're going to use our old friend doorbench doorbench has been going for years um, <laughs> guy over there has been doing a great job um, maintaining this idea that there's a test project that you can run and it will sort of benchmark your system based upon the number of plugins it could run. It's a brilliant idea, it's superb, and it's very, very, very useful. So in this scenario, we're running Reaper, which is an excellent door, and within it, we've got uh, the same compressor plugin installed and inserted on 40 tracks of sine waves. What you listen to is a little eight track band that's playing and as we add more and more effects uh, the cpu load increases to the point where you can no longer handle anymore and it crackles you then the idea is you back it off until you get stable playback and that's your benchmark now in previous years the previous generations of the surface have produced all sorts of different results to this but i've done a little bit of testing of this already and it's good we're getting quite i think quite a jump in performance with this surface pro 9 and that's a really good thing to see so i think what i'll do for this i'm going to bring you in a little bit closer so you can see exactly what's going on because i'm not convinced my overhead camera is really up to the task okay good so this is reaper these are all the the channels of audio here this in the we're in the mixer console and these are all the plugins that are installed it's a simple compressor plugin, and we are using multiples of them to see at what point the system chokes. So at the moment, I've got 40, 80, uh, up to, I don't know, how far away are we from the edge? 40, 80, nearly 120, uh, 115 plugins running. And that was the point at which uh, I, I found that it started to crap out last time. <laughs> so that's what I left it at. So what we're looking for here, we're looking at the load on the processor. We're looking at the temperature it goes to and whether it can maintain that stable playback. So I'm going to bring up some graphs which are going to help us, hopefully. Just have to tell it what it is I want it to look at. So the clock, temperature and load. And it shows them all on the same graph, which is not always awesome, but hey, that's what we're going to go for. So as you can see, the green line is showing us the uh, the clock. So at the moment, because uh, there's no tweaking involved in this system, the system is managing its own clock. And then you've got the red, which is the load, so how much it's actually doing. <laughs> and this graph is going to be a little bit of a pain every now and again. And then at the top, you've got your temperature, which is completely flat. So the machine is just doing its own thing at the moment. It will sit there and it will drop and it will drop because it's trying ultimately to save power and to save battery, um, which is that's what these sorts of machines are designed to do. It's not necessarily what we want, but hey, let me show you how that's going to work. So we're going to come back to our thing. I'm just going to um, back off a little bit. Back down here. By bypassing a number of these effects because they only are valid when they're running let's see how it's going so that's our little tune which is going to go around ad nauseum and what we're 
what we're looking out for is a point at which that starts to crackle. So if we look over here at our clock speed, clock speed is 3.19. I mean, it's, it's just ramped massively up to its turbo speed. The load is 83%, so we've loaded up the processor quite high, well, very high, I would say. And the temperature is around 60 to 65 and seems happy at this moment. If we look at our graph, we can see what's gone on. So the load has gone very, very high. Uh, the clock has steadied pretty good, pretty good. And the temperature, that is slightly a bigger cause of concern. But let's load up a couple of extra plugins and see what happens. So we are on 34. So I've got two rows of 40, that's 80 plus um, another batch. <laughs> So the load is now at 87. Let's see if I can get up to, oh, it's flipping sticky keys. So the load is now on 90, but the clock has dropped a little bit. Interesting, but it's still maintaining it. We're on about we're just under 120 plugins, which is a lot. So the load is just over 90. The clock is starting to waver a little bit. Temperature is just below 70 degrees. The playback's still good, yeah? Now one interesting thing is that the fan has come on. There is nowhere on the Microsoft website, on the Surface website, that tells you that the i5 has a fan. And so that was a bit of a surprise to me when I was testing this, that a fan came on. Because the previous generation, the i5, did not have a fan. It was perfectly passively cooled. And that is good because you don't want that noise, frankly. However, active cooling is ultimately going to be better. Oops. <laughs> okay what's happened oh my goodness so while we've been talking the temperature has been creeping up and now uh, the surface has decided it's too hot you can hear the fans come on the fans really running now so it's trying desperately hard to keep it all cool so its last line of defense if the system is getting too hot for itself is to clock down and that's precisely what has happened the clock has dropped from the 3.1, 3.19, down to 2.4. And that has completely destroyed our project. So that's exactly what we expect to happen. It's exactly what I would have predicted would happen, is that as soon as you hit a certain temperature threshold, the system clocks down and your project craps out. So that's no good, because you need consistency in if you're running a music project. If you're just playing on a synth like I showed you earlier, that's fine, you're gonna get away with whatever you like. But once you start making projects, once you start loading up tracks with instruments, with plugins, once you start developing a song on the Surface Pro 9, it's going to need to maintain a certain level of processing power. It's no good. You can't have it running for five minutes going, oh, this is ace, and I'm loading on lots of interesting plugins you're producing, and it's really, really going really well, and then suddenly it gets slightly too hot and it decides to clock down and you lose half the power of your system. Because all your plugins crap out, your audio will crap out, and it will no longer function. And you're gonna have to either wait for it to cool down or stick it in a fridge or something in order to make it recover so you can get those gigahertz back. So this happens every time with every generation, and I think I know what to do problem is the reason why I go and I think is because Windows 11 keeps changing Windows 11 keeps chucking out all the old things that we used to do in order to make the system work and I wonder what it's chucked out this time because I haven't looked at it for a little while so uh, what we are going to attempt to do is work out a way of making that processor stick so that it doesn't suddenly clock down to 2.4 clock down to 1 
and ruin your project. We need it to maintain a speed which is going to keep it within its temperature profile and consistently work. That's the plan, right? That's, that's the plan. How are we going to do that? Well, I, let's have a look. So we normally do this in the power settings. It's a very simple single setting which should enable us to essentially kill the turbo. That's what we're trying to do. Now, well, people go, oh, you can't do that. Look at all those gigahertz we're going to lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is sad, but we have to sacrifice something in order to get stability. We have to. We have no choice. And it's interesting about the different the way these different processes work because in a previous generation, I think it was the I think it was the seven. It had a very low stock speed uh, and a very high turbo speed. And so when you locked the processor to its stock speed, which is what we're going to attempt to do, you lost a huge amount of performance. But that was the only way to keep it steady. Now with this, as far as I can see, I think about 2.4 gigahertz is going to be the stock speed. We're going to find out in a minute. And that ain't bad. That's not bad at all. So I've got every hope for this. <laughs> right, so let's see if we can find the power settings. PowerPoint? No, that's not what we want. Power edit a power plant. Plan power power let's try that okay so in the control panel we have what looks like the good old-fashioned power settings so it the, the moment the basic settings are that when it's on battery uh, it turns off the display i'm not interested in battery this whole video is going to be done with this plugged in now i know i talked about it being portable well, you know, which it is because you could move it but running music software without the power plugged in will essentially remove your ability to run it as a stable platform you can run it on battery and it will run on battery even when when you've tweaked it properly um, but you won't get a huge battery life out of it because we're trying to keep that processor speed going high so i'm not going to worry about battery for the moment i might do another video on that at the moment we're going to stick with with the main feature which is keeping it plugged in so but what we're interested in are these advanced power settings down here <laughs> well it looks like we got what we need so we have uh, power options advanced settings what we want to go down to is the processor power management we've got a minimum processor state and a maximum processor state minimum we're not interested in but it's the maximum that we're interested in. So at the moment, it says the maximum processor state can be 100%. Now, traditionally, if you turn that to 99%, that should disable the turbo. And that should give us a stable processor speed. I've not tried this. Let's try it out. So we just stick that to 99. I'm going to hit apply. Then we're going to reopen our project. Now, we must remember first of all, that we have lost that top end of processing power that we had previously. At least we think we have. It depends, because I'm looking at that clock now, and that clock is still moving. That's a worry. Hey, well, let's just set it going and see what happens. <laughs> nothing. Nothing happens. Okay, so it's immediately clocked back down to... Um, to 2.4 even though the temperature wasn't particularly high so that's interesting i wonder what sort of behavior we're experiencing but what i'm going to do is just remove a bunch of these plugins to start with just so that it's not so overloaded all right so i've gone down to about 90 plugins let's see if that works in a word no <laughs> that's a worry so what's going on here then oh it just plummeted yeah this is not being completely successful as yet maybe the thing that we didn't do was we need to set the minimum processor state to the same so that also needs to be 99 maybe that's the thing that's gone wrong let's try that Okay, what's interesting now, oops, is that we're getting uh, the clock speed now up at 3.19, maintaining, <laughs> but it's not handling it. So this is curiouser and curiouser at the moment. Okay. 
Okay, so we've currently got stable playback. We're running on about 65 plugins. But it's really interesting how the load seems to be much greater. It didn't, this has kind of got the same load, it says uh, here, 90% load, as what it had running twice as many plugins when I hadn't disabled turbo mode. And then saying that I've disabled turbo mode doesn't seem to be quite right because it appears to be running at 3.19. Curious, very, very curious. Now the processor is dropping to about three a couple of times as that temperature is going up and I can hear the fan now kicking in. So I wonder what's gonna happen next. I wonder also what would happen if I pumped these back up to 100. See, now I've put that back up to 100, the, the load has dropped and the processor clock is now moving around a lot more. Now, as I say, we're on half as many plugins as we did on the original test, uh, where it sort of got too hot and then clocked down and, and broke. So at this point, uh, with nothing really tweaked in the system, I'm able to maintain a relatively good level of playback with the processor still moving about. Because what I'm expecting to see, what I was absolutely expecting to see, was kind of a, a level here, like we've got here at 3.12. I was expecting to get that in around the 2.3, 2.4 mark, and that to be the level at which it always stayed, so we can maintain good playback. The problem with it being up at 3.19 is that it starts to get hot. And so what we're seeing here is that the system is starting to get hot, it will clock down a bit, clock down a bit, in order to keep that temperature where it needs to be. I would rather have a flat CPU that's running rather than this up and down, because we can't use the full capacity when it's up because it keeps dropping down. We can only use the capacity of it as the bottom end here. So as I load a few more plugins back on, now we're back up to 80, and the system on the whole is trying to cope with that really, really well. I mean, the, the computer is actually behaving as it should, is the point. And it's just that we would like it just to do something slightly different. See, the fans come on again. The load's only at 80% though, so let's add a bunch more. And we're going to get back to the similar situation we had at the start, which is where uh, we can run about 120 plugins, but then it gets too hot and clocks down. So there's 100, and it's coping with that really well. The temperature has been increasing, as you can see. The fan has come on, and we're going to hit that point at which it starts to, to crap out very soon. It's now clocked down to 2.5. Oh, <laughs> so it's just on the edge of falling apart. So what are we to make of all of this? Well, it's, it's quite fascinating, I have to say. A little bit unexpected. I hope this is all going to be a lot easier than this, but as it is, it's going to be tricky. I mean, on the one hand, you've got the system behaving beautifully as the system it's supposed to be, in that it's maintaining playback, while shifting and compromising on temperature, compromising on gigahertz, it's shifting those two things about without it just immediately leaping to crackle. Now, in my first test, I had loaded it up really high into sort of over 90% load. And at that point, you know, it, it hits the temperature, it has to do some drastic measures in order to sort it out because as the CPU drops, obviously the load goes up because it's now running not so fast. Running this test, where I had fewer plugins running, but still a large number, still 100 rather than 120, it was able to clock down and the load still stayed within those parameters. So it's almost as if you could see that you could run up to about, if you run up to about 80% load, 
in normal mode, maybe it will maintain decent playback. Maybe that's enough. Maybe it needs no further tweaking and you've just got to you know, work within the limits of what it's offering. And that's no bad thing. However, I like consistency and I like things to be to be flat and predictable. I don't like to be working in an environment where I may hit the end at any point. I rather know what that is. Although that is also the experience we have when using computers. There's always going to be a limit and it's always that potential of adding too many plugins and getting to that point. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to examine exactly what we can do to improve and what we can do to tweak the system because there are some settings in here that are not yet currently available to me, particularly ultra, ultra performance mode or high performance mode. At the moment in the power settings, what we have, our only options are balanced. Now, in my experience, balanced is OK, but it's deliberately turning a number of things off and down. And if you were able to select a high performance power plan, that actually does a lot of other things in the background to enable better performance on your system. But obviously at the expense of battery life and saving the planet, that kind of thing. So that is what we want to try to find. And there is a way of enabling that. And I want to see if that's still possible. So I've had some lunch. I've done a bit of research. I've also looked back into the video I made on the Surface Pro 8. And what I found there was quite interesting that I'd kind of forgotten about, I think. And that in my conclusion on the Surface Pro 8 was that the, the Surface as a whole was so well behaved that I just kind of, I kind of left it alone. Even though I did test the um, removing the turbo mode and reducing it down and those sorts of things, I generally found that it performed well enough without any messing about <laughs> so that I could just leave it, leave it running and go with it. And actually, that's kind of what I'm finding here, because the system has been so well behaved. I mean, particularly when you stick in an audio interface, it just it just sort of works. Now, that top limit of temperature, CPU going up and down and causing you a problem. Yes, yes, that's definitely a factor, but it's all going to depend on how big your projects are and how much you're going to push it. But anyway, the Surface Pro 9 is different to the Surface Pro 8 because I'm finding that it's not reacting in the same way as previous generations. And I have not been able to turn off turbo mode in the usual ways. I found another way to do it. So the first problem we had was that in our power plans, there's no such thing as another power plan. But now there is. I've put that back in. Because the balanced power plan is the one that Microsoft wants you to use, because that's the one that, that retains the integrity of the surface the best. It keeps the temperature and the CPU speed locked to each other so that it, it carefully manages that whole situation and give you the best performance in all situations. And that's great. But us being pains that we are, we just want it. We want more. We want to be able to control these things. And so I dug out ultimate performance mode, which you can do with a little bit of a registry and a power hack. So I've done that, it hasn't helped. In fact, it's made things worse. So let me show you what I mean. So I've put it to ultra performance mode. Now the screen's gone a little bit dark simply because the contrast colors are set differently. Don't worry about that. But within here, you get a whole stack of extra settings under the advanced power modes, which none of which are actually particularly useful, but hey, there, there they are. And under your minimum and maximum state, you can again set 100% or 99%. I'm just going to stick it on to 100. And then we're going to open our project and I'll show you what's going on. So the first thing that you notice is that the CPU speed has now gone whacking up to about 4 gigahertz. 4 gigahertz? It was at 3.2 a minute ago. That's slightly odd. But also, it's going all over the place. So here, it's at four gig. Is it four gigs, for heaven's sake? So you think, well, okay, I've got loads and loads and loads of room for stuff. Possibly. So we're now up to 80 plugins. Uh, the CPU, as you see, has been 
bobbing up and down to about 3.99 but juddering about the place. Now the temperature has been up to about 60 but that also has got a little bit high uh, while the load is being, being maintained. But as it goes, it's being relatively well behaved. And in fact the behaviour is very similar to what we had in regular mode, but it's being at 3.2. Now the fan's really coming in, I've seen the temperature go above 70 now. So now it's clocked down to 3.3. See so it's shaved this off in order to cope with the temperature. See it's going to keep coming down now. It's now dropped to 2.4. We're going to find the load is now up to 96%. We're going to hit a bit of a problem. And we are on about 100 plugins. That's 110. And there we go. So there you go. So with ultimate performance power mode enabled it's enabled the processor to go up further which is interesting but you still end up having to come down to the same sort of place because it's going to have a problem with temperature and start clocking down so that hasn't that hasn't really helped so if we go back into the power settings and do the thing which should disable turbo mode which is to set it to 99% Let's see if this gives us the stable CPU speed that we're after. The answer to that is no, it is absolutely not. It went rocketing uh, straight up to four gigahertz, more or less, and then stayed there for a bit and then threw itself about the place. But it was interesting that we got much better performance out of it set to 100% uh, when it was hitting the same sort of gigahertz mark, but it was just behaving much, much better, allowing you to give a bigger and bigger load. Whereas this said it was on 3.9, but its load was still was already maxed out and we had far fewer plugins running, none of which makes any particular sense. So where does this leave us? <laughs> Well, baffled, bamboozled and confused as, as usual, I imagine. Well, there's one other thing I can try. I had a deeper look into uh, disabling turbo mode on the more recent uh, surfaces and I found a little registry hack, a little power scheme hack, which enables us to do just that. So let's, let's try that out. So for this, we need to be running the terminal in admin mode. So that's this fella here and we need to put some stuff in here. Now, for all of this, I'm going to put what you need to put in here so you can do this for your own experimentation. I'm going to stick that in the text of the article on the Molten Music Technology website that this video will appear on. And so all the detail will be there and you can follow that directly because I've already fiddled with this a little bit. <laughs> so I'm only just trying to undo the undo that I undid before in order to make it happen. Okay, so essentially what we need to do is disable turbo mode, which we do down here. You see, this is kind of the display of our current power settings, which we are still on ultimate performance. And that is actually something I'm going to come off at this point. Or shall I? No, I'm going to stick. Shall I? I don't know. <laughs> Let's stick with that for the moment. Uh, and the, the setting we want is down here. These uh, current AC and DC power settings. AC being for when it's powered, DC for being when it's um, on battery. And that too means that it's set to aggressive mode. So we have some different performance boost modes here. Aggressive at guaranteed. Interesting. Efficient, aggressive, efficient, enabled, aggressive, enabled and disabled. So all of those things may bear a little bit of further investigation and perhaps we'll find other ways of doing things. But I'm just trying to keep things at a base level. So I'm going to disable turbo mode and I'm going to see what happens. So to do that, I need this command here. 
and this should set it to zero. So if I was to run that same thing again, it should now tell me that. So now AC power setting index is zero. I'm going to save the current power scheme so that it survives during a reboot and then I'm just going to restart to make sure that everything takes correctly. Now interestingly the clock has started straight away at 2.4. That is what I've been expecting all this time. Now of course we're going to get a drop in performance because it can only now maximize at 2.4 but the key thing here is that it's not going to get too hot. The temperature has now essentially been taken out of the equation because there's no way that 2.4 gigahertz is going to raise the temperature enough to get it to clock down. So that is no longer an issue. The only issue now is that we are at over 90% load and we've only got 50 plugins loaded. I think we can go a bit further. So what's important about what we're seeing here is that it is all flatlined. The load is consistent, the temperature is consistent, the CPU speed is consistent. And that's giving us an absolute known level of performance. So we know that we can run 60 plugins every time, every day of the week, all day. <laughs> and that's the point of taking off turbo mode. You absolutely know how much you can do and you can work within those boundaries and you're never going to hit that problem of overheating or your system clocking down in the middle of a project which is going to ruin what you're doing. That is the key. Now, are we hampering ourselves too much is the next question. Because if we can do this level of plugins in balance mode with the CPU doing its own thing, we could potentially get more performance. Provided that it doesn't cut into this level, then it will be better and easier for your system as a whole to run with a free running processor. Hmm. So let's do a comparison. So I'm going to undo what we had before, put in the same command, but put it to two. Yeah, that's back enabled again. I'm going to put us back onto our original balanced plan. Our minimum and maximum are at 100. Just notice the clock has now got up to 4.4 gigahertz. I think I might have broken it. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to persevere. So this is the same project with the same level at which it was happy to run at 2.4. See, it's interesting, this time around, the CPU is up and down all over the place. And that does not fill me with particular amount of confidence. I mean, there haven't been any glitches, so it's held together fine. The temperature is fine. It's just that that CPU is behaving like a bit of an idiot. So oh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what on earth are we supposed to make of all this, Robin? Hey, what are you trying to tell us? Is it any good? Is it not? Is it bad? What is it? What is what? Well, I mean, it's, it's a really good question. It's a good question. Slightly frustrating that I'm not able to give you a definitive answer exactly at the moment. I think what we're seeing, I mean, the best light I can put it into really is that uh, yeah, once again, Intel and Microsoft and their and their special relationship has made it difficult for us to really grab hold and control the processor within uh, the Surface Pro 9. Um, Surface Pro 8 seemed to be working really well. We got that nice steady 2.4 clock, and that was that was that was good. Now we can find that in here with a little bit of deeper digging. I've been able to to sort that out and perhaps that is the best way forward. But I found generally with the Surface Pro 8 that just letting it run seemed to be the best solution. And perhaps that is still the best solution for this. And maybe we've actually got to a point where people like me just need to stop fiddling with it. And <laughs> just let it be and everyone's gonna have a good time. Maybe. Rather what I'll do now, I think, 
And so I'm going to plug in a bigger audio interface just for a change of difference. I'm going to make a project. So I'm going to make some music on it and see whether that works. I'm going to push that to, to a point that seems sensible and see whether the, the processor will handle it all by itself uh, or also whether it will handle it without turbo mode engaged, so running purely at 2.4. I'll have a look to see if those two things function. And, and in doing so, hopefully I'll be able to answer the question of can you run a medium-sized project on the Surface Pro 9 without any bother? That's going to be the key. Right, so I've just recorded uh, a few a few tracks into Studio One using a range of different um, instruments and effects and guitar and bits and pieces. I've only got what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tracks of stuff, but you know, that's a sketch. That's something to throw down. And what I'm going to do is kind of duplicate and build out those tracks just to see how far how far we can go. It doesn't really matter what it sounds like, just as long as it's not actually glitching. That's kind of the plan. So if we look at the CPU meter at the moment, that's been chugging about the place. <laughs> up and down, up and down, thinking about it, but I've not heard any glitches, any problems. The temperature is all completely fine. That's all smooth. Um, the load has been good. It's just simply just chugging along. So in Studio One, What we're going to do, as I say, is just duplicate tracks and see at which point it all sort of falls apart. So I'm just going to bring everything down. And actually, what might be a good idea is to add some further plugins onto these just to increase our plugin count. So I've got uh, plugins on the guitars at this moment, but nothing on anything else. So I'm going to add a bus, drop a reverb onto that. So let's solo this piano. Let's add a supercharger to the mini Moog. Put some dynamics onto the drums. Let's add a delay to the synth. So I've now got a whole load of stuff going on in there. And as I say, what I'll do is I'll duplicate the tracks to see how many tracks it can kind of do. So at 24 tracks of that, we start getting it to crap out. Can't really see a particular reason why. You know, it's not really the temperature, it's just that the CPU is, is bouncing around. So let's save this. Let's mess with the, uh, the CPU and the power settings and see if we can improve it. So just to go back, we're on balanced. Let's try ultimate performance. Put this back on 100%. Now, as you can see, hopefully, we've got the difference between balance mode here and ultimate performance mode here. Is this strictly scientific? Who can tell? But it seems to be that on balance mode, it would hang around between the 3.2, but also clock all the way down to one point something. And that's, that was what's causing us the problem, I think. Whereas in ultimate mode, we're staying, we're still moving about, but we're staying up much higher and sort of shifting around between the two to four gigahertz mark. 
and that's allowing our project to run much more successfully. Now, of course, the other thing to test is our friend, the, the turbo disabled version. Can you still hear a little crackle? So yeah, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Very interesting. So restricting the clock to 2.4 is, is really undermining our performance at the moment. We're now dropping down to about 14 tracks. I mean, it's still, it's still okay. It's still a 14 track project with uh, multiple virtual instruments and plugins, but it's not as good as a, uh, it's a 24 track project, <laughs> I wouldn't have said. So yeah, what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us, I think that perhaps there is something in ultimate performance mode that maybe that is going to give us something, uh, an extra level of something that we have to still stay behind that moving processor but it gives us a lot more performance than restricting it to 2.4 and more performance and running it on balance mode. Hmm. So maybe that's where we are at the moment. So to conclude this enormous, this enormous investigation into fiddling around with a, with a little computer that should know better, what do we find? Well, we find that generally speaking, the Surface Pro 9 works all right. It works all right chugs along nicely and if we were to stop messing about with it it would probably do completely fine it's not going to do masses and masses it's not going to do huge projects you're not going to be able to crunch in 50 different virtual instruments all into one big fantastic mess of plug-in rich awesomeness no 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 but for, for making music, for recording your modular and external stuff, for recording a band, for doing you know half a dozen tracks of audio, dozen tracks of MIDI, virtual instruments, plugins, that kind of thing, the live performance of triggering loops and things like that, I don't think are going to be a problem. And so overall, I kind of feel quite positive about the whole sort of thing. What is annoying is that I can't quite nail down exactly the best way to run it. In, in some ways it's because the processor and Windows situation has improved, it's got better, and it's now more able to run itself without your interference. And that gives us a certain amount of sort of anxious assurance because you want to be in control. You feel, you feel through all these years of wrestling with computers that you want to be in control. And actually you don't have to be, you can just let it do its own thing and it will probably be fine. So as I was editing this video down, I had a few other thoughts and I've unearthed a few other little bits of pieces that might help us work out exactly what's going on in this testing. And that's to look at what the CPU is. So if we dig down into what the processor is all about, it's an i5-1235U, 12th generation Intel processor. And what we discover is something very interesting. It has... 10 cores, which is cool, but it has two performance cores. And then it has eight efficient cores. What the heck does that mean? I don't know, it's news to me, but because I don't build computers anymore, I don't spend my entire life in, in the world of Intel and processors, then these sorts of things kind of pass you by. So it's very interesting to discover that actually there's a, a two point turbo within this processor. Um, first of all, there's the efficient core maximum turbo, which goes up to about 3.3. And then there's the performance core max turbo, which goes up to 4.4. That's exactly what we saw. Now there was a bit in the information I found about disabling the core that talked about turning on a performance boost mode, which is what I think I've done. And that's why the system changed from hitting a level at 3.2 ish 
to hitting a level at 4.5 something ish. It's because I'd enabled the performance core max turbo frequency possibilities. So that's why we're getting this kind of staging going on. In one session it's going at 3.2 and another one it's going at 4.4, 4.5, something like that. But what effect is this having? Well, we saw that in ultimate mode, which essentially has that turned on, it actually works better than it does in balance mode. And overall, leaving it with this higher performance capability seems to give us the room to work underneath where that CPU is moving. At least that's what we can see. But I think this probably bears further and deeper investigation. The same for what all those different power modes meant about being aggressive and efficiently aggressive and things like that. So there's more to learn, I think. But hopefully the time that I've spent testing and demonstrating this to you has given you a fair idea as to what it can do. So back to where I was. I still love the form factor. I still love all the touchy stuff. The fact that I have it wired in to my Euro rack and other bits of hardware and I can reach out and press the record button rather than having to find a mouse or to find a keyboard shortcut. That is brilliant. Being able to draw automation with the, the pen is still awesome. Being able to reach out and touch controls and synthesizers is all brilliant. By way of another test, as there's no end to the endless tests that we could be doing, this is Bitwig Studio 5, the beta version, and I'm running just one of the, the demo tracks. So this is Turbo Off, 2.4 gigahertz, running one of the demo tracks. A little bit of glitchiness there, that's not very good. So what we'll do is we'll turn off what we did with the whole turbo thing. So there's a good example of it running much better if we leave turbo mode on. I think that's a good place to leave it. Don't you? Yeah, that's plenty. So I hope that's been helpful. Uh, I'm Robin, this is Multi Music Technology and Surface Pro Audio. I've been doing this for years. So if you've enjoyed what I do, do come and support the channel. Subscribe, do all those sorts of things. Come and check out what it is I do. The majority of the stuff that I cover these days is synthesizers, modular, but all sorts of music technology and hopefully a whole new range of software on the Surface Pro 9. So all of that get mixed in to the channel. So do come and check it out. Or if you're feeling particularly daring, come and join us on Patreon where you can throw me a couple of dollars and then enjoy direct communication and contact and get involved in the community over on our discord channel and generally help me make more videos which is what we're all trying to do so i hope that's been helpful in the meantime go and make some tunes <laughs>